Hello, my name is Robert Don Moyer. I'm a professor of leadership studies at the University of San Diego. Today we're at the University of San Diego and we have two truly interesting visitors. Uh, David Kilgore is a former member of parliament. You were in parliament from 1979 to uh, 2006 and when you decided not to stand for re-election. And David Matus is with us. And David, I know you do a number of things, but among other things, you are an international human rights attorney. Both of these gentlemen have, are prolific writers, and we're here to talk about one particular book today, a book called Bloody Harvest, which they wrote in, uh, published in 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 2009. Oh, it was, that's a 2009 book, and won the, uh, the book won for you guys uh, the, uh, the Human Rights Award from the, the International Society for Human Rights in Switzerland, right? Yeah, no. yeah uh, along with all the, uh, all the other work that you've been doing. Um, the uh, uh, the book is called Bloody Harvest, and I as I since I've read had a chance to read a bit of it, um, the title is both partially a metaphor and partially literal. And um, tell what could one of you? Why don't we start with you, David? T tell us a little bit about what the book is about. The book is a uh, is an update and a refinement of the two previous reports we did, and it's. Uh, it's written in a friend, reader friendly way to explain this horrific thing that's happening in China, phenomenon that's happening in China, and why, uh, what people can do to try to stop it, namely the, the killing of a very large community, uh, Falun Gong community, uh, as individuals to s traffic in their organs to both Chinese and to foreigners. And f tell us about. I think it's amazing that we don't know, or I don't know, maybe, but I suspect I'm not alone in this country, that I don't know a great deal about this. The only reason I know something about this was because the person who invited you here to campus mm -hmm. and who's asked me to do this interview, mm -hmm. um, one of my doc students, uh, has informed me about it. But until I talked with him, I didn't know much about Falun Gong or about uh, the organ harvesting that's going on. Tell, uh, uh, David Matus, can you tell me about uh, Falun Gong? A little bit. Uh, I, I'm not a Falun Gong uh, practitioner, uh, and, and neither is David Kilgore. And, and to a certain extent, we got involved in this partly because we were outsiders and independent and were able to exercise an independent judgment on, on this whole issue. Uh, Falun Gong is a set of exercises with a spiritual foundation, uh, which was started in 1992 by Li Hongji, who began teaching about it. Uh, it uh, is uh, a blending and updating of uh, ancient Chinese traditions of uh, the Qigong, the exercise traditions, the uh, Taoism and Buddhism. Uh, it spread throughout China very quickly uh, uh, because this was a after the uh, collapse of the Iron Curtain and the collapse of the Soviet Union and the uh, shift within China from socialism to capitalism so that there was an ideological vacuum in China. Uh, the, the, the exercise, the Falun Gong, was actually encouraged initially by the authorities on the basis that it was healthful and, and, and it cut down on the health bill in a system which uh, was uh, financially in dire straits because of the extraction of money away from the health system uh, with the shift from socialism to capitalism. And, and, and uh, people, uh, Li Hongji won some prizes and uh, Lu Rongji, the prime minister at the time, actually encouraged uh, this uh, practice of Falun Gong because of um, the, the, the beneficial consequences, the, the health of the people and the finances, the health system. And, and it grew from a standing start in 92 um, until 99, according to government uh, estimates, they were estimating the size of the various NGO communities. The, it was 70 to 100 million practitioners, which was more at the time than the membership of the Communist Party, which was um, 60 million. And uh, it, it was throughout the country, throughout the party. There were 3,000 practice stations in Beijing. And, and the party at this point uh, took ideological fright and became jealous of the popularity of a movement, which was uh, rooted in ancient Chinese traditions, uh, uh, a, a spiritual, uh, totally different from the Communist Party, which was atheistic and uh, a Western import. And, 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 and the party uh, banned it in 99 uh, out of this jealousy and fear uh, and, and has since propagandized against it uh, and uh, has insisted uh, that uh, people abandon the practice uh, 
If uh, they find practitioners in China, they uh, arrest them, ask them to recant. If they don't recant, they're tortured. If they don't recant after torture, they're disappeared. And they have become by far the number one torture victims in China, according to the UN rapport to earn torture. Two thirds of the uh, torture victims in China. They represent uh, uh, about half of the arbitrary detention, uh, re-education through labor camp population. Uh, they are detained to this day uh, in, in the hundreds of thousands in these re-education through labor camps. Uh, they have since also, although it started as a Chinese phenomenon, um, David Kilgore and I, because of our, our reports in our book, have been traveling around the world to, to talk about it in uh, over 40 countries, over 80 cities. And what we found is that uh, outside of China, uh, Falun Gong has become a global phenomenon. Uh, and uh, in, in the United States, Canada, and Australia, the immigration countries, there's still a lot of Chinese ethnics that are practitioners. But everywhere else, the practitioners are basically local and, and cease to be a, a, a Chinese phenomenon. Now, the persecution sounds awful. It, one could understand why people might be in the Communist Party might have been jealous and, and sanctioned persecution. But it, this goes a little further than uh, persecution. The title of your book is Bloody Harvest, and uh, so and and the book talks about uh, organ harvesting. Yeah. Can you talk about that, David? One of the first pe people we met with was the wife of a former surgeon, uh, and she told us, and I guess this was two thousand and six. Uh, she's now a refugee living in the United States. She told us that her husband, during the period 2001-2003, had removed the corneas from the eyes of, of approximately 2,000 Falun Gong practitioners in a place called Sujiatin in, the, in rural China. And uh, he told her in detail how he'd done it. He couldn't sleep. He had nightmares. Uh, eventually, she got him to stop doing it, and they ended up leaving the country and, and uh, she's now in the U.S. And in fact, at one point, her, husband, her former husband was in Canada. But what basically happened was that, that people in a, would be brought into a hospital in, near Sujiatin and they would uh, be given, a, I guess, a light anesthetic. Their corneas would be removed. Then they're, they're unconscious at this point. They'd be taken into another room and their heart, lung, all their vital organs would be removed for sale purposes. Uh, and... Um, it was eventually they, they did all the operations in one room. But but the the, the thought of this uh, now, a lot of people unfortunately have attacked her. So what we've done in the book is we've basically got about fifty two kinds of evidence. And I, I was a prosecutor for ten years, so I should know something about evidence. And you may say I don't like uh, the one I just get mentioned to you. I don't like the fact that we had people, for example, calling into China to hospitals and prisons and and saying. Uh, uh, do you have Falun Gong practitioners available for organs? And the answer in about 15 institutions across the country was yes. We recorded those conversations. We had independent interpreters. So uh, that's that's number two. And we've got about another 50 uh, pieces of evidence that I think lead any fair-minded person to the conclusion that this truly is, is taking place in China and is continuing to take place. Well, you're talking about organ harvesting, right? Yeah. And so uh, tell us about that piece well, of it. Well, if you, Robert, want a, a new liver, you can go on the internet and you can, I think still, you can fly to a place like Shanghai, check into the number one people's hospital, and they take your blood type and your tissue type. And then uh, they go on the computer base and they, because all of the Falun Gong practitioners, which David mentioned a minute ago, are in these work camps. They find there's a match for you in, say, camp number 75. Somebody goes out to camp 75 and brings this compatible person into a hospital. He, it's a he, is given a light anesthetic. His liver is taken out, and of course he's dead. The liver is then flown to you in Shanghai by the People's Liberation Army aircraft. You've paid probably $60,000, whatever the price is for a liver at the time. And uh, you're told you're getting the liver from a convicted uh, cr criminal who was going to be executed anyway, so you're desperate about your liver and you, you want to believe that, um, that, that the person was going to die anyway, and you fly back to San Diego with your, with your new liver and somebody has died so that you could have the new liver. That's a lot more than persecution. That's, uh, that's uh, something that David has called a new crime against humanity, and we've just been, uh, and we've actually talked to people who've made, been in these camps, Falun Gong practitioners, and uh, I'm going to talk to one in the talk tomorrow about a, 
young woman who was who was worked 16 hours a day making products for export like Christmas decorations, and uh, and there are about, the estimates vary, but there are about 300,000 people working in these forced labor camps, and uh, every three months a doctor would come in and examine her from top to bottom, and she'd say to herself, well, why are they examining me? They they have no interest in me except to torture me or to overwork me for nothing, but. Now they, she understands, and people understand this, they're being tested to see how good their organs are for, for, for sale of the organs. This is something unimaginable to, to, to uh, I think, to most human beings in China and in elsewhere. And you said there are other people in the labor camps, but it's only the Falun Gong uh, people who get, uh, who get tested and whose organs are harvested. Do you have a sense of why? Oh, oh yes. We have, in fact, uh, interestingly, when David got our awards in Switzerland, we had a... a meeting with the transplant society in, in Switzerland, and the doctor, who's the head of it there, he said he heard this woman get up and say how she'd been tested and wh how she'd been tested in these camps. One of them was, uh, was a, uh, um, a, a scan of her organs, and he said he, he, he agreed, he just the penny dropped for him then because he realized she wasn't being examined for her health, she was being examined to see whether, an ultrasound, uh, through an ultrasound to see whether her organs were in good condition for being, uh, for being sold. But so why, they, why is it only the, only the Falun Gong practitioners? Because the, the Falun Gong practitioners don't smoke and drink. They're healthy. They exercise. They uh, tend to be, uh, to be healthy. And our phone calls uh, uh, push this point, too, that the, the people want organs from Falun Gong. That's why they would phone the hospitals and ask them if they have Falun Gong available or prisons, if they have them available for, uh, for, for, for transplants. So it's a business decision, in a sense. And, and it's a business decision... Uh, D David, um, that involves the government. It's, it sounds like it's a whole government governmental policy as opposed to some crackpot part of the bureaucracy. Is that is that correct? When the system um, first cracked down on the Falun Gong, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, Falun Gong community was spread throughout the party, so there was a lot of leakages. And we've actually got the memorandum from uh, Jiang Zemin to the Central Committee of the Communist Party asking uh, mm -hmm. for the banning of Falun Gong, so we can see what the reasons uh, were uh, mm -hmm. that were given. Uh, the banning uh, by the party was in June 1999, uh, and, and by the state was in July 1999. Uh, and uh, initially, it was ineffective, and it generated uh, a lot of uh, protests. And there were people coming out to Tiananmen Square and, and saying, you know, Falun Gong is good, and so on. Uh, and and the, uh, the, the party set up an office called the 610 office, with uh, 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 610 being June 10th, uh, the, the date of the banning by the party. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I don't know how familiar you are with the, the way the Chinese party works in China, but basically they've set up a shadow organization paralleling the whole state structure. And, and, and it's the party that tells the state what to do through this parallel organization. And so the 610 was part of this parallel party structure that was telling what the state what to do in terms of persecution of Falun Gong. And uh, the... Uh, so they set up this structure, and they could see it wasn't working. So then the party called a meeting in November uh, uh, 1999 uh, in Beijing. And again, there's leakage, so we know what went on in the meeting. And, and they announced a kind of shift in policies, a kind of a more severe crackdown in Falun Gong. They said uh, uh, to uh, defame their reputations, to bankrupt them financially, to destroy them physically. Th those were the words of the, the 610 office. So. <laughs> Uh, this physical destruction became uh, a party and state policy for the Falun Gong. Uh, now, uh, there was a number of things going on at once. One was this policy of destroying them physically. Uh, second was the big money to be made from the sale of organs. Uh, the, I mean, because there's a global demand for organs and the money that could be made was huge. Uh, the third was the need of the health system for money. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the health system was losing money because of the shift from socialism to capitalism and they needed money and this was a good way of simply uh, keeping the, the doors open. Another factor was the, the nature of the military because the military in China is not a defense activity only, or even a, an invasion activity only. It's a um, in a conglomerate business, uh, and uh, and and the military is involved in hospitals, including transplant hospitals, as a way of making money for the military. Uh, and and the military um, 
have a, a, a very similar culture uh, uh, to the prison guard system. Uh, they're in their close ties to the prison guard system. The, uh, <clears throat> there's also, of course, the demonization and marginalization of the Falun Gong. I mean, uh, 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 although this demonization was not uh, the, the awful things that were said and believed about the Falun Gong were not the reason for the beginning. They bec uh, the banning, they became an ex post uh, facto uh, justification uh, for uh, the, the repression. And, and so the Falun Gong uh, people said there was an evil cult, that they, they, they killed themselves, they killed others. Uh, and, 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 and so within uh, the party and the prison system, people started to uh, believe this dehumanization, depersonalization. We've talked to many people who got out of prison and said, you know, you're not people, we can do with, uh, with you whatever we want. Uh, there was also the and, and your evidence would suggest that th that just wasn't true. That was all fabricated. It was a big lie, but that pe was eventually believed. Oh, oh absolutely. I, I, I mean, uh, it, it's. Uh, I mean, you, you just have to meet a, a Falun Gong practitioner. It's, yeah, it's, actually, I have. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The uh, we've met them in about forty countries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and 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 then there is the, the the awful sordid history of organ harvesting because. Uh, when China started transplants in the 80s, uh, I mean, from the get-go, they, they were sourcing organs from prisoners. Uh, the China has not had a donation system to last year, and even the donation set up, they last set up last year has generated zero donations. Well, 37. Is it, was it 37? 37 in one year across China. Oh, wow. Those are the <laughs> So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, statistically zero. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and they don't have a law allowing sourcing from the brain dead, cardiac, alive, accident victims. They're virtually the sole source of organs. I mean, if you went with your relative to a hospital, you could make a donation, but virtually the sole source is... Uh, is prisoners, and it was uh, started off prisoners sentenced to death and then executed. But the uh, I, and China executes a lot of people. But uh, you know, as the demand for transplants increased, it eventually bumped up against the ceiling of the execution uh, totals, and 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 so. They needed the money. They had this uh, huge demonized population, and and and, and uh, the. The population of the Falun Gong, uh, they were doing, uh, in the end, uh, 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 now what they're doing is about 10,000 transplants a year. Uh, but the, the population of the Falun Gong in these re-education re labor camps is in the hundreds of thousands. So they had this huge organ donor bank uh, uh, that was available, a lot of money to be made. These were non-persons. Uh, policy was destroy them physically. Uh, I mean, we don't have a... Uh, a policy directive saying kill them for their organs, but it, it, it's the confluence of these events. The party for sure knows they're being killed for their organs. I mean, it's the military is is doing it. And the military is is obviously part of the state. So and uh, so, I, I would say in terms of complicity uh, 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 and 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 in terms of knowing it's there and not doing anything to stop it uh, in, in terms of criminal intent, I think it's there. Uh, so so that's that's the way I would put it. Is there um, any response to world, there's been world pressure, any response to world pressure? Um, oh yeah, we've, there's been a lot of responses. In one way, the response has been this, is that uh, Australia, for example, a number of Australians were going, but uh, as a result of pressure, which a lot of us have tried to create, Australians have virtually stopped going to China for organs. In the case of Canada, we remember we did a study where we found, we did check three hospitals, and we found that over a two to three year period, about 100 or 200 Canadians had gone for organs. We haven't got figures, unfortunately, for the US, but uh, there's no doubt that, that because of this pressure that's been created, as I said earlier, the, the organs are now probably going to wealthy Chinese rather than the, rather than. So there's still a market, it's just not an international market. Percent, yeah. yeah, yeah. One of the interesting things for me is how little uh, many of us in the U.S. know about this. Uh, why? What's your hypothesis well, or what's your evidence? David's been to San Diego before. We've been to New York and to Pittsburgh and to just about you name it. Uh, we've been to a lot of places in the States. And um, some of the media have been helpful. The Christian Science Monitor, for example, has been very good about this. Frankly, I, I think the New York Times carried an article once when our first report came out, but I, the papers like the Times and the Wall Street Journal and uh, and the Los Angeles Times, if I'm not mistaken, have not been uh, covering this issue. And, and perhaps it relates to the fact that your government is, all, uh, dare I say, almost owned by the uh, 
by the, the government of China in terms of the number of treasury bills and so on, more than two trillion, if I'm not mistaken. That's a lot. Uh, and we've been to the State Department, I guess, two or three times, and I think the State Department knows and accepts what we're saying, but they won't say it. And maybe the reason they won't say it is that if they say it, then they have to do something, or at least protest about it. The Congress has been very helpful by the bipartisan support in in Congress in the last Congress and the yeah, there's a resolution. Yeah. yeah. So we Only have no Ron Paul, I think, voted against yeah. it. Yeah, we have no complaints with the uh, with the members of Congress. In fact, uh, we're very grateful to the members of Congress from both parties. Do you have any evidence? Um, I mean, is, a, is that a hypothesis that that the major media outlets aren't covering it, or do you have some some more concrete well, let, evidence? And well, the reason I'm I just to, to lay my cards on the table, the reason I'm asking it is uh, the doctoral student who brought you here, uh, my son's a reporter in Washington, and he asked him why the media hasn't covered it. And his response was probably said uh, the, the conspiracy theory didn't make a lot of sense to him. He, his answer was Americans are egocentric and, um, and ethnocentric, and they'd rather read about Lindsay Lohan, I mean, it, it, things close to home, and this is distant, and, and they're not necessarily directly affected by it. And I, that's a, maybe a cynical view, but he had an alternative hypothesis. So that's why I'm asking you about evidence. Well, here's my experience with CNN, and David will have his too. I, I was in Australia, and I was to do an interview with CNN in Australia about the organ pillaging. And uh, the last minute was canceled, and later I discovered why. the. the uh, person CNN in Hong Kong, in fairness, not CNN in the U.S., had had an agreement with the government of China that if they discussed this topic from Hong Kong, they had to have a representative from the government of China on to reply. And because, of course, the government of China had nothing substantive to say, I presume, about the issue, therefore she couldn't talk to me because they, she couldn't get someone from the government of China to give a, an opposing point of view. So the interview was canceled. She did say she'd do it in the States, but uh, CNN has never called me back. Perhaps they've called... Uh, Called David. David, have they? <laughs> CNN, uh, uh, no. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say that it's either one cause or the other. I think it's a combination of both. I, I mean, how much reporting do we hear about the, uh, the regrettably, the millions of people killed in the Congo in the Civil War, yeah. or the millions of people who died of starvation in North Korea? I, I mean, uh, there's uh, human rights. Uh, of course, this is the problem when you're dealing with human rights, because uh, I've dealt with human rights more or less all my professional career. And mostly when people talk to me about uh, human rights, what they're talking about is themselves. Uh, very few people are, are uh, kind of concerned about somebody that has no connection to them, that is not physically in front of them, that has no ties to them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and getting the human rights message across means getting people to realize that this is not happening to somebody else, mm -hmm. it's happening to us as part of the same human race. And, and that's always a very difficult message to convey, and uh, in this context, uh, as many others. But I, I mean, the fact of the matter is also that China is an influential, influential financially, influential politically. Uh, to, I mean, uh, uh, my colleague has given you the example of CNN. Let me give you an, another example. Uh, the Chinese government has produced a a video <laughs> of us, uh, of our report, where, where they inter I mean, it's a piece of Chinese propaganda. Uh, and uh, they, they interviewed the, the people we interviewed, and, uh, or, or like people we called or people we quoted, and basically got them to say what the party wanted them to say. Uh, didn't interview us. It was done in Mandarin. It's available at the embassies. But it was broadcast on Phoenix TV. Hong Kong television station, at the time owned by Murdoch, a major Western media figure, yes, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and who's very interested, uh, of course, Phoenix TV. I mean, Phoenix TV is in Hong Kong, but it, it wanted to penetrate the Mandarin market in China. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, I would say it, it, it's, it's a combination of, the, of, of, your, of your son's explanation and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the uh, phenomenon uh, of uh, China as a global economic and political power. Uh, yeah, makes sense. Prior question, um, is it accidental that, that your work, your Canadians and this movement, I mean, your work has come out of, out of Canada. Is it just that you two happen to be interested in it? If you were attorneys in the U.S., do you think you'd be doing the same thing? Or is there something about the Canadian culture? I know you've just, David, uh, you, you've just written a book um, uh, or, or published a book uh, that you co-authored with a, an American diplomat mm -hmm. on, on the, two, the two different uh, uh, 
visions of North America from the two very different countries. And so is there something about Canadian culture that makes this issue more salient? Or is it just accidental? Well, that you it's probably it? accidental, but I, I mean, as a Canadian, I should tell you that I think that we've had a long had a warm relationship with the uh, People's Republic of China. We've uh, done trade there. When I was in, in the cabinet of Mr. Kretchen, we had, I think I went on two trade missions. Uh, the relationship has been long and deep and friendly with with the uh, with the PRC, and so uh, maybe it was coincidence, happenstance, serendipity that the two of us did it. It could have been two Americans or two Brits or two Germans, or I suppose, easily, but they just happened to come to us first. Maybe they wish they had gone to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll give a try at that too, uh, because uh, we have been asked many questions uh, over many years, but I don't think anybody's yeah, ever asked us. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't trying to come up with an original one, but. <laughs> uh, so, so let's see. Uh, now, first of all, I wouldn't say uh, the concern about this uh, or the work on this is a uniquely Canadian phenomenon, because in, in the United States, we've had Kirk Ellison, who's done a lot at the University of Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, in Britain, there's been Ethan Gutman, who's been doing a lot of work on this. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the International Society for Human Rights uh, basically endorsed our cause, the Swiss branch, which right. uh, in Switzerland, yeah. the Human Rights Without uh, Frontiers is an NGO that's uh, helped us uh, a lot and are headquartered in Belgium. So I, I wouldn't say it's just uh, Canadians, but I, I do think there is a, a, I guess you could say, a, a characteristic of Canadians that maybe makes it more likely than uh, the Americans, because the United States is, is, is a bigger country uh, and, and it tends to be more self-contained, whereas United uh, uh, Canada being smaller and, and also uh, proportionately has a, has a very high uh, immigration. I mean, the United States has a high immigration, but Canada proportionally has more. We're uh, almost at one uh, percent of our population every year comes in as immigrants, uh, and uh, China is the largest country. Yeah. Uh, and and China is is one of the leaders, in, in, and and and. As a result, uh, we have become very uh, open to the world and very interested in the mm -hmm. world around us. And a lot of the Canadian experience is going abroad and uh, mm -hmm. reacting w with events abroad. And mm -hmm. so uh, it, it becomes, uh, I would say, uh, very natural for Canadians to slip into this mode. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah, it, it is a good answer and very natural for people in the U.S. sometimes not necessarily to do that. I mean, we elected a, a president who, uh, who was wealthy but had never, I don't think, or had only been abroad once. Uh, and, and, you know, so it's, it's a very, it's the problem of positional power, I guess. When you have a lot of power, you don't have to attend to the rest of the world. You probably noticed that 90, more than 90 percent of Canadians would have voted for Mr. Obama? Yes. It's according to one, the economist did a survey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a, I, I think there is some, probably something cultural there, although we certainly have pockets here who uh, would, uh, would be allies and doing similar work. Final question, has any of the work that you've done affected what's happening in China? Is there any sense, do you sense that there's any sensitivity now? Is it just a public relations sensitivity? It, well, I'll give you, David will give you a, a, a good answer. I, I guess one of the things I've been contemplating lately is, uh, is uh, I heard recently that that a general working at the Chinese embassy in Ottawa said to somebody that they were getting inundated with emails and phone I guess phone calls and like from people complaining about this the treatment of the Falun Gong community and he this, this was obviously bothering him deeply. I have a, a friend who recently went back to China who's a, an immigrant to Canada who uh, was approached by the security service there and was told that. Uh, in a moment of weakness, I guess, by one of the security officers, that in f the Falun Gong community are good people. And I think, in fact, I read in the paper that Jiang Zemin, the president at the time when they were banned, has, was quoted as saying that the biggest mistake he made while he was the president of China was to ban and persecute the Falun Gong. Now, if that's accurate, and um, I can't vouch for it, but if that's accurate, I think they recognize it's a major mistake, and I think now they have to they have to stop it, and uh, and uh, well, it's going to be hard to do for the reasons we've been talking the about. The economic reasons. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, no, I, I, well, we've been on this for five years now, since 2006, and over the course of five years, we've seen a lot of changes, both abroad and in China. Uh, well, one is that the Chinese now, officially, as a matter of policy, give priority to locals over foreigners for transplants. Mm -hmm. uh, they have passed legislation banning uh, the sale of organs, uh, the uh, banning the uh, sourcing of organs without consent. Uh, they have set up a donation system. Uh, 
they have promised a law sourcing uh, uh, the organs uh, from the brain dead cardiac alive. They acknowledge that all or virtually all organs come from prisoners, uh, so the, the debate becomes just which sort of prisoners. They admit uh, that sourcing of pro uh, organs from prisoners, any sort of prisoners, is wrong, and, and, and they will uh, eventually get off of it. I mean, a lot of the, I mean, even those changes, you can argue, are, are, are cosmetic, because on the ground, the volume hasn't changed, but they, and they've done a lot of other cosmetic things. I mean, they've generated a lot of propaganda against our report. I mentioned the video, but yes, there's, yes. There, there's been actually attempts to try to shut us down around the world, uh, including in uh, California. Uh, one time I was scheduled to speak at uh, uh, a university in uh, San Francisco and uh, got uh, cancelled at the last minute, and the university has a Confucius Institute funded by the government of China. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, the uh, and there's I, I mean that is just suppositional that it was because of pressure from the Chinese embassy. But there's lots of instances where I can actually give you a chapter and verse. And uh, they they have taken down uh, the websites that we quoted in our report. We've archived them. You can see them. But uh, th they have uh, made active efforts in a lot of different ways uh, to. Uh, shut down our sources of information. Uh, they used to have a, a, a liver transplant registry uh, in Hong Kong, which was open to the public, and, and now they've, uh, they've closed it down. And I mean, it, there's a lot of different ways in which they've reacted to our report. Uh, some, some of them haven't been positive. Uh, some of them have been positive, but only at a, at, at a propaganda level. And uh, so, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, it, it's kind of, uh, I, I, you know, my view is over, over the course of these years, the problem has gotten worse rather than better because the, uh, it, it, the death penalty has gone down, but the volume of transplants has remained constant, meaning the sourcing from Falun Gong practitioners has increased. But uh, at, at another level, we can see that the party and the state is moving uh, at, in a lot of different ways over time in response to the report. And in, in my views, we keep on the pressure, they'll keep on moving. A final question for you. What can people who are viewing this video do if they want to uh, not sit on the sidelines and... and uh... Sure, they can, they can go and see their congressman, woman. They can go, they can email, they can write a letter to the editor, they can... Uh, they can uh, uh, come to meetings like the one we're having tomorrow, they can go after their congressman. Because uh, our, we, in fact, Rohrbacher is from California, and he's probably been the most supportive of all. Mm -hmm. But the vice chair of the committee, uh, before the Republicans went out, was also very supportive. So I don't think it matters a bit who the parties are. To go and see whoever they are and get them to do something. Get them to call the State Department into one of their committee hearings in Washington and ask the State Department why they have never even, even as far as I'm aware, they've never even uh, dealt with this issue at all. Uh, so everybody can do things in their own way, or he or she can define things to do, and, and uh, take 20 minutes, pick up your phone and phone your congressman and say, do you know that this is happening, and uh, uh, how can America tolerate this? Or, and for lastly, they can try to get a bill passed that says before you can import something from China, Christmas decoration, for example, the importer has to show that that, that product was made by, by, by voluntary labor. And there has to be some kind of a certificate that says this. I don't know how many people have lost their jobs in, in, in the United States and Canada and Europe and Mexico. But it seems to me this is one, at least one simple way, is demand that goods shipped to the U.S. be shown to be not made by forced labor. Has anybody introduced that bill? It would well, seem to me a simple thing to do. Yes, your government has, but they don't, there's no inspectors, there's nobody, uh -huh. there's, there's, I take it, totally ineffective enforcement. Yeah. So how about having some inspectors in China that go around and look at where the, this Christmas, uh, one of the things that our, our witness is going to tell you, I've seen a, a Dr. Lee, who uh, was in jail for four years. He was actually making little Christmas uh, uh, um, slippers. When he came, finally got out of camp, thanks to pressure, uh, he came back to the United States, and he went in the store, and he found the slippers he'd been making in his forced labor camp. Well, how can this be? And maybe oh, anybody listening to us could try to get people like Gao Shang or Lu Xiaobo, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, or many, many others, try to create pressure to get them uh, put a, uh, released from prison. Phone the Chinese embassy or the consulate in Los Angeles. Or is there one in San, in San Diego? Uh, not sure. We'll, we'll do that and, and uh, create the kind of pressure that the ripple effect. So they're, yeah. they're, everyone's got things yeah. they can do. Thank you. Anything to add? He did a pretty good job.
Uh, well, it, it, what can people do? Uh, I, I, my view is, is that it's not just one thing. Uh, there's no magic button on this. It's everything uh, mm -hmm. and anything. Uh, that doing something is better than doing nothing. Uh, that let people know that your concern, uh, whether it's your the local people, uh, your representatives, or the, or the Chinese government. Uh, when you're dealing with human rights, human rights belongs to humanity. Human rights belongs to the individual. Human rights uh, doesn't belong to governments. Uh, and and uh, it, unless human rights are asserted by the people who have these rights, they will wither. And and uh, and as as I said uh, earlier. Uh, the rights that are being violated are not their rights, it's our rights. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not just their rights, it's our, uh, our rights as well, because we're part of a, a common humanity. And we have to realize that, accept that, assert that. Uh, and, 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 and that's the best way of uh, ensuring that they're not violated. I think we're going to bring this part of the conversation to an end. I want to thank both Davids uh, for a very, very stimulating conversation and for some very, very important work that you have been doing over the years. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.